Prince Faisal and his Arab army make their victorious entrance into Damascus on October 3rd, 1918. In return for supporting the Allies, Faisal expects to rule over an independent Arab Republic stretching from the Persian Gulf to the Mediterranean, including Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon. General Allenby meets with Faisal and Colonel Lawrence, breaking the news that under previous arrangements, France is to rule in Syria and Lebanon, while Britain will take charge in Palestine, where a Jewish homeland will be guaranteed. Predictably, Faisal objects strongly, but to no avail. He is vastly outnumbered. At the Paris Peace Conference, the victorious allies dictate peace terms to Germany and Austro-Hungary. The Treaty of Versailles is signed on June 28, 1919. During the peace conference, Lloyd George argues that Great Britain should play a dominant role in the Middle East. He reminds the delegates that more than a million British soldiers are stationed there and that a quarter million have died or been wounded there. French losses in the Middle East are far less and the United States hasn't even fought there. One maxim of military doctrine has never changed. To control an occupied country, a government needs to have enough troops to do the job. One million British soldiers can get the job done in the Middle East and maintain order among the civilian populations. But those troops are about to disappear. Many have not been home since 1914, and their attitude is verging on mutiny. General Allenby understands the danger of disgruntled soldiers in foreign lands, and in the spring of 1919, convinces the War Office to bring the boys back home. To fill the void being left by the British, Lloyd George calls on another ally, Greece. In Athens, Prime Minister Eleutherios Venizelos is more than happy to oblige. His government has its eyes on Western Turkey anyway, with plans to make it part of Greece. Sending an army of occupation at London's request will only make the job easier. And the Greeks can also make sure the Italians in southern Turkey don't take more than they've been promised. Prince Faisal, the Arab representative to the Paris Peace Conference, finally agrees to exclude Palestine from a new Arab Republic. Chaim Weizmann and other Jewish Zionist leaders are intent on making Palestine a new homeland for their people around the world. Lord A.J. Balfour has written a declaration to that effect. It reads in part, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. Dr. Chaim Weizmann, the Zionist leader who is uh, responsible for the issuance of this statement, insisted that it be a public engagement. It had to be there on the front page of the newspaper. There was, uh, he correctly saw that um, only an agreement that was open and public would be considered legitimate in the post-war world. That the very, the very secrecy with which other agreements were made suggested impropriety. And that was a very astute observation of Weizmann's, uh, and it made an enormous difference in, um, in the Balfour Declaration. But Faisal and his Arabs still demand control over Syria and Lebanon. France, intent on dominating both areas, sees Faisal as nothing more than a British puppet and Arab independence as nothing more than British manipulation. French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau is frustrated by the political intrigue and at one point in the negotiations, bursts into a rage and offers Lloyd George the choice of pistols or swords. Lord Balfour is more cynically detached and describes Wilson, George, and Clemenceau as three all-powerful, all-ignorant men sitting there and carving up continents with only a child to lead them. Lebanon becomes a battleground for French troops, Arab rebels, and British security forces. Arabs attack the French with frequent raids. British forces stop the French from retaliating. 
Small wonder that Clemenceau has challenged Lloyd George to a duel. Winston Churchill, rehabilitated from his role in the Gallipoli disaster, becomes the government's new Secretary of War in 1919. He warns Parliament not to disband its army too soon, lest the new peace cannot be enforced. Yet by 1920, the British army in the Middle East has shrunk to about 300,000 men. There was a, a British army of about a million men in the Middle East. And there was no other organized armed force in the whole of, in the whole of Asia. So Britain was in a position to impose her will, to make any settlement she wanted. But Winston Churchill warned that that situation was in its nature a temporary one, that it was very important for Britain to impose her terms before disbanding her armies. Because if she disbanded her armies first, she couldn't get her terms. This advice was unheeded. And Britain did indeed go ahead and dissolve her armies. And the result was that within months after the uh, armistice was signed, you had got one, one by one disorders and uprisings in every single country of the Middle East. London and Paris are the only two governments left to settle matters in the Middle East. Italy has dropped out in disgust, and the United States has opted for isolationism. But Lloyd George is undeterred by such realities. He is determined to redraw the map in the Middle East and to add nearly a million square miles to the British Empire. In Ankara, General Kemal monitors the land-grabbing frenzy and bides his time. The new Turkish government and its army are about to make a reply. French diplomat Henry Franklin Bouillon goes to Ankara and reaches an accord that ends the conflict in Turkey. Paris formally recognizes the legitimacy of the Ankara government and will no longer deal with the Sultan in Istanbul. The Treaty of Sevres is canceled and Lloyd George's carefully drawn map of the Middle East is now a meaningless piece of paper. Britain feels betrayed by this separate piece engineered by the French. London and Paris, two governments that suffered through the Great War together, are no longer allies in the war that continues in the Middle East. By October 1921, all French and Armenian forces are evacuated from Turkey. Now General Kemal and his army can focus on yet another enemy, the Greek army that lies to the west.